My name is Dr. Lee Wynn, and I am a radiologist in the Portland metro area, and the title of this talk is Introduction to Musculoskeletal Imaging. I don't have anything to disclose. So how do I approach studies? The first question is always, was the correct study ordered? Every study is ordered for a reason. There is a question that is being posed, and can I answer that question with the study that is being ordered, or the questions? That's always important because we want to do a good technical study. Uh, we want to make sure that we're able to answer the question. If we can't, then it's important to just take a couple steps back and start where we're supposed to. And so there are times that studies get canceled and the correct studies ordered or the patient needs to go somewhere else. And so even before jumping into anything, uh, it's important to just check to make sure that the correct study is being ordered on the correct patient. Because once you walk down a certain path, then then you're stuck on that path. And, and th that's how kind of errors happen. So that's always the first thing. After you have figured out that you're taking the right study on the right patient, then you have a framework that you want to fall back upon to. It's uh, often the case that all of these frameworks and uh, systems that you put into place become second nature and you don't even need to think about them, but it's nice to have. So in radiology, there's a movement for structured reporting. And then in terms of just learning material, a lot of times people use mnemonics. So in musculoskeletal imaging, a good one that I've found and I've used over the years and has just become part of my subconscious is ABCDS. So I will talk about that later. The next thing is where's the prior examination? and this includes any examination containing the region of interest. This is important because a lot of times the answer has already been given for the question or questions posed, and uh, I don't think that we're going to have a unified healthcare system anytime soon. And it's pretty amazing when you kind of consider that oftentimes studies are repeated, and sometimes they need to be repeated, but other times, the answer has already been given. It's just the person asking the question wasn't given that answer. So part of the prior examination in my mind, too, is the report that goes to examination. And when we're considering what we're doing for the patient, it's important to have the studies of available. And if the studies aren't available, then the report is also um, very important and actually can can help us and are actually very necessary, in my opinion. All right, so the next thing is we are responsible for the entire examination. Can I explain everything that I see? If not, do more images need to be taken? Is the study incomplete? And then the image is only a part of the story. Is there more to the story? So it's important to remove as much ambiguity as possible. And so you're going to be the one taking the radiograph or doing the CAT scan or acquiring the MRI sequences. Make sure that everything kind of makes sense. You know, once you start getting into this, oftentimes things will kind of happen that will be out of the norm, and you're going to be the first person to kind of realize that. And a lot of times there are artifacts or there are other things that are not right. And so the earlier that they're addressed, the better, because then you're not trying to fix something after the fact. Sometimes more images need to be taken. For example, if there is a very large patient, then you're not going to be able to fit the entire femur on a two view of the femur and so you just need to take more images you know same, same thing like with an abdominal radiograph on um, a morbidly obese patient um, is the study incomplete sometimes a certain question is posed and an extra image needs to be taken for whatever reason and so th that's just something that you have to assess uh, not every study is going to be the same just because and then the image is only a part of the story. Is there more to the story? So as a radiologist, I most times for these diagnostic images do not have any interaction with the patient whatsoever. And so I just have what I have in front of me. And you actually have a lot more than that because a lot of times the physician will give a history that is either incomplete or incorrect or for whatever reason there's something not right with it. And a lot of times it's telephone talk because they're not even the ones ordering, putting in the order, right? They, they have MAs, they have other people who are helping them in their office. And so the image that you take is part of the story, but if there's more information, that's very helpful. And so from a practical standpoint, um, if there's more information that you can add, make notes on the requisition, that type of thing. So removing as much ambiguity as possible. I put this 
these two little blue structures and just because all I have is say a two views of say this is a penny right and so I can make a 3d image in my mind with these two images but I can only do that if I'm given as much information as possible and so it's up to you guys to do that for me because we're all in the same team and so if, if you can imagine this is a two view of the penny that, that those are perfect views um, in AP and a lateral right um, but if one of those views is not taken true AP or true lateral, then I get two images. One is actually telling the true story and the other one is kind of an oblique view. And so a lot of times when we're looking at the images that are taken, part of our job is to actually state what image was taken, AP, lateral, oblique, whatever. And sometimes that's not always possible. In any case, remove as much ambiguity as possible in terms of everything before the image and after the image is taken. So the framework is ABCDS, that's what I use, and or the mnemonic. And as you can see, it's alignment, bone or bone marrow, cartilage, disc or joint space, soft tissues. And once the anatomy is mastered for all of these areas, then comes the physiology, and then comes the pathophysiology. So it's really a struggle, I think, and it's something that I work at still. There's a lot of anatomy to know. There's a lot of physiology to know, and then a, a lot can go wrong, but you have to start off somewhere, and so it's the anatomy in terms of alignment, um, the bones, you know, what are what does a normal bone look like? Where does the cartilage in a joint go? Uh, where, where is it normally? And then disc or joint space, and then soft tissues. So what's in a bone film? It's more than just bone. There's multiple densities that are present. But when we talk about bone film, you know, we're just looking at the white stuff, the bone, and we think about that first, right? But even within the bone, we can tell different things about it because of these relative densities. And in radiology, it is all about the contrast. The contrast is what allows us to deduce things. In CT, uh, in com computed tomography, we talk about basic densities with water being the calibration material. It has a density of zero Hounsfield units. Uh, in CT, photons are used, it's, it's x-rays. And so really, in terms of radiography, it's the same physics, the same concepts are at play. So the CT basic densities and Hounsfield units, which the way my brain works in looking at a, a plane film, it's the same as looking at a CT image because they're created in the same way, really. So I, I wanted to incorporate that into just thinking about bone films. Different substances have different Hounsfield units, with water being the calibration at zero, more lucent or less dense materials will be negative. So you have fat around negative 100 and then air at around negative 1,000. If you're going the other way with uh, more dense structures, more solid structures, and you have soft tissue at about 30, bone at about 700. And then metal or contrast is going to be even more than that, a lot more than that. Now we're going to talk about bone basics. And here I have a partial image of a PA view of the hand. And I just pointed out a couple of structures. There are more structures that I didn't point out, such as the fat planes or the soft tissues. Bone basics, basically composed of an outer layer or periosteum. And then after that, you have this compact bone, um, this cortex. And then within the central aspect, you have a trabecular or cancellous portion of the bone, also called the medullary cavity. Other body parts, other viscera also have these terms into terms of in the kidney you have a medullary space and you have a cortex and so the same word is basically applied to many different body parts so that's helpful and easy. Bone is mostly composed of calcium hydroxyapatite in terms of the crystal formation and you start out with a woven layer of bone that then gets transformed to lamellar bone when we look at healing, this is kind of uh, what we're looking at too. A lot of times orthopedic surgeons order films to assess for healing, and we can see these things. There's a constant turnover of the bone matrix, and it is dictated by the activity of osteoblasts, which form bone, and osteoclasts, which take bone away. And uh, Wolf's Law states that there's an increasing stress causes increased bone production and it makes sense. Your body is just trying to optimize and put strength where it is needed. So um, people who work out more end up challenging their bone more and more, more bone gets laid down. This is just uh, 
uh, basically a, another schematic of what I was talking about. Something else on these images is basically the concept of primary and secondary ossification centers. And bone growth usually occurs around an area of a growth plate or the physis, and I'll be talking about that a little bit more. Long bone anatomy, there is the physis or uh, growth plate, and above the physis you have the epiphysis, and below it you have the metaphysis, and then uh, even further away below the metaphysis you have the diaphysis. And so when looking at bones, when there is a growth plate to speak of, when there is a physis, then these terms have a meaning. Once the entire bone is developed and completely fused, you no longer have a, um, a growth plate. And so um, by definition, there is no epiphysis because it's not over anything anymore. The physis doesn't exist. Um, it's all just the metaphysis. To describe what a pathologic process that may be occurring within a region of overlap. You can either say diametabazeal or metadiabazeal. Children look different. There is a range of normal for each age. And after you look at a couple of hundreds or thousands of films, then you, you kind of know what that normal is. Maybe a couple of decades ago, uh, the training was to take comparison views of the contralateral limb as an internal control, but probably it's not necessary in most, most cases. It's not usually a part of my practice, but this may be institution dependent. The thing that I do tell people when they worry a lot about the radiation, because uh, with Alara principles, um, it's coming up more and more, and it should, where we should try to radiate gently as little as possible. In musculoskeletal imaging, because most of the radiation dosage is from scatter, the relative radiation from an extremity radiograph is very little compared to other body parts. So I usually tell that to people who are kind of very worried. Um, at the same time, if there's no reason to take an extra image, there's no reason to take an extra image. And so, for example, there was a recent case of a little boy who fell down and broke a rib, and the technologist called me up because it was a multiple view a rib series, and the rib could be seen on the first image that he took. So why take another image? There's no pneumothorax. They're not going to do anything differently. We have an answer to why the boy has pain. And uh, so we stopped there. Okay, so here's some more uh, of the anatomy that I was talking about. And this is kind of interesting because the metaphysis isn't labeled. And also I was talking about complete fusion. This looks like a pretty mature bone. And so, but I think I like this just because they've got done a cross section and you can kind of see where the compact bone is and then the medullary cavity. We don't see the ossification centers because they are all fused. And in fact, if I was dictating something out, I would not refer to these as uh, epiphyses uh, because the growth plates are now fused. I would refer to this as a distal femoral metaphysis, for example. But the diaphysis is always the diaphysis. It's kind of always the, the center portion of the bone, the shaft. And so shaft and diaphysis are pretty much uh, similar. Metaphysis is basically below the growth plate, right? Once it fuses, well, this is the metaphysis, this whole area up to where it starts thinning out and becomes uh, constant diameter, the diaphysis. So this right here would be the diametaphysis, as we were pointing out on the other slide, uh, um, a junctional region or uh, metadiaphysis, if you want to switch the words around. There's a lot of variants. I said children look very different. So for example, these things come up where someone has trauma and um, people haven't fused yet. So for example, we're looking at this hand and we see these ossification centers. The bones form from a cartilage matrix first. And so sometimes there can be these variants and this is just an interesting one, uh, a pseudo epiphysis. Um, as you can see on that second metacarpal, it looks like there's a growth plate on both ends. This isn't a fracture. This isn't a fracture either. I just threw this in. It's a nutrient foramen. The anatomy, like I was saying, you start uh, learning it. And then after that, the physiology and the pathophysiology. So normal anatomy is really important. So you don't label it as pathology. And so, for example, this nutrient foramen, it almost looks like there might be a little sclerotic border to it. It's been there probably a while. It's very subtle. And these things kind of come up in clinical practice all the time where where people wonder if there might be a fracture or not. As important as it is to call a fracture or pathology if it's there, it's as important to not call pathology when it's not there. We can create problems. Uh, forces on bone. Bones are really interesting. Depending on the force, 
it'll do different things. Uh, a good example is in the ankle. You can really tell what type of motion, what type of force was on that ankle causing the different sites of fracture. The three major ones um, are compression, a pushing force, a tension force, a pulling force, and a shear force, a twist force. Here's a compression fracture of the spine, probably the thoracic lumbar junction, a very common area for a anterior wedge compression fracture. And so this is an example of a pushing force. And this is an example of a pulling force, where it's a pushing force, you get trabecular impaction. You saw in the prior slide where things kind of become more dense. This is more white relative to the other vertebral bodies. In this case, the opposite is true. It's pulling away. It's not pushing all these um, trabecula onto each other. So it's pulling away. Also, the fracture is kind of more a transverse fracture. So it's a just different type of force. It's a different type of look. And... Um, it's a transverse fracture of the patella with displacement um, because of the action on the quadriceps. I threw this picture in because this is a more subtle fracture. You can barely see it, but this brings a lot of the concepts that I've been talking about earlier in this lecture into play in terms of the different densities and how we can see things. And so I like this radiograph because you can see all these basic densities I was talking about earlier. Air is really very not dense. And so it's um, black here, right? And then fat is not as dense as bone or soft tissue, but it's denser than air. So here we have a fat plane um, right here, right? And then here we have some soft tissue density, but there's also some water in there probably. But And then here we have bone. And we don't have metal in this radiograph, but we have metal here. So you can see the K wires in this figure of eight construct, they're more dense than the bone here. The hardware is really important. Every time I see a post-surgical study, I'm looking at every pin, every wire, every staple, because that's what the expectation is, and that's how we're taking care of the patient. So if there's a question about hardware, you want to be sure you're imaging the entire hardware. And that's what I was talking about earlier in terms of making sure that you have a complete study if, if that's the question that's being posed and requiring an answer. So forces concentrate in areas of non-homogeneity. We have stress risers and stress shielding. Every now and then I'll get a call from uh, one of my colleagues, uh, maybe a radiologist or a clinician or something. And so going back to Wolf's Law, where basically if you have an increased stress, then you have a reaction to that. Well, when you have something like this, and this is a, a hip replacement, and it's taking most of the force. So this bone's not seeing much force on it. It's not being required to do much for the body. And so basically the equilibrium between osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity is falling on the side of the osteoclast winning. And so you're getting more lucency here. And it almost looks like it could be a tumor or something, right? But it's not. It's just stress shielding. In the same vein, there's more happening here because you have a torquing effect. And so that's why you have all this cortical thickening. Um, and and if you're going to have loosening, it's going to happen in areas where there's the most motion, right? And these are the things that we look at. Speaking next about fractures, that's kind of our bread and butter, all ages. And the location is important to describe the position, the alignment. A good radiology report will describe enough that you may not even need the, the images. And that's what I was talking about earlier in terms of what's the prior study, what does the prior report say. Alignment is uh, of the utmost important. Uh, if two bones are going to be next to each other, then there is a high likelihood that they will fuse, they will heal. But if displacement is great, especially greater than two millimeters even, then um, that's something important. Angulation is very important. If it's very angulated, then the two bones may heal, but they will not be healing in an alignment that is anatomic, and that's not very helpful, right? So basically, we want things to be less than 15 degrees angulated so that people will have normal function still. That's a malunion if bones heal, but not in a correct position. In muscle skull imaging, union is basically healing. Distraction, uh, overlap and rotation are other things to mention. Comminution, the word comminution means uh, multiple pieces. So if you have greater than two fragments, then it's a comminuted fracture. And other words that imply comminution are, or denote really, are butterfly and segmental. So if you have a butterfly fracture or a segmental fracture, it's a comminuted fracture. There's more than two fragments involved. 
Uh, joint involvement is really, really important. If you have a fracture going into a joint, then that means that you really need to get all of the alignment and everything exactly spot on. And even if you do, the person is still at risk for early development of arthritis and pain or loss of motion, loss of function. Is it open or not? Most times they don't comment upon this, but um, it's important to get a good radiograph that isn't underexposed or overexposed because the presence of gas is always important in all settings. Um, gas where it doesn't belong may not just be secondary to a fracture or trauma. Uh, it could be secondary to an infection or other things. And sometimes we can see this uh, on plain films. Next, foreign bodies, very important. If you have a foreign body, it can serve as the nidus of infection. And that's why I was talking earlier about making sure that everything on the film is identified. A lot of times people implant things in their body on purpose or um, have things that they can't remove. And it's very important to note this on the requisition. If, if for whatever reason, the ring couldn't be taken off or the necklace choker or whatever. I mean, these are, they're essentially all foreign bodies and they may not mean anything. They may be completely clinically insignificant, but uh, the only way to know that is to have the other, to have those other data. So, and then um, the underlying pathology, anytime I see a fracture, I ask myself, is that a fracture that's just due to normal trauma or is it because it's a pathologic versus an insufficiency fracture? A pathologic fracture is secondary to a pathologic process, such as like a tumor, for example, whereas an insufficiency fracture is just there isn't enough bone there. And so when we get older, we all get osteoporotic. So, you know, getting enough calcium, that type of thing. But basically, um, it's an insufficiency fractures just are become a lot more common with, uh, with age. Okay, fractures continued. Complete versus non-complete. Um, children get non-complete fractures just because. And then most times um, you'll, we're going to see complete fractures in adults. And talking about fractures, we talk about the orientation, transverse, oblique spiral. I already showed you that transverse fracture of the patella earlier. That nutrient foramen would have been an oblique or spiral fracture if it was truly a fracture and not a nutrient foramen. And in terms of incomplete fractures, we have all these other descriptors that we can use. Um, it could be a buckle or a torus fracture. Those two terms are completely synonymous. It could be a green stick fracture, so-called because if you try to break a green stick, it doesn't completely break through one end will break and the other side won't. And, and so this fracture looks like a, an immature um, ranch, you know, a green stick that's been broken or you're trying to break. And then plastic bowing deformity is kind of interesting because sometimes with kids, you can actually see the fracture, but it's it's there because the there's a bowing deformity. And so uh, that's really important. That's why uh, the views are, are really important to get right, okay? And so, for example, the forearm, there's a natural undulation to both the radius and the ulna. And if I have two good views, then I can can talk about things such as a plastic bowing deformity. I put an arrow on it right here. There's an outright fracture there, but this this bone is also too, it's, it's too um, angulated, and so there's a, a deformity there. But if we don't have two good views, then it'd be harder to say, right? And then here are other examples of fractures. The buccal fracture of the distal radial metaphysis is better visualized in the lateral, and we can still see it here, but it's harder to see. A lot of times with fractures, we only get to see it on one view, and that's the whole point. In trauma imaging, we always want to do at least two views, if not more. So displacement is always described distal in relation to proximal, and a lot of times it's as well described or better described in terms of cortical or shaft width rather than absolute length. So if I'm saying that there is one half shaft displacement posteriorly at the distal radial fracture versus saying three millimeters, uh, you know, I think it can bring up an easier image, right? Another thing about displacement, sometimes you talk about overriding or bayonet apposition. So these are all just terms to help someone else visualize what we're looking at. This radiograph right here shows a fracture of the distal radial metaphysis, which is posteriorly or dorsally displaced. And so it's always the distal fragment moving relative to the more proximal fragment. It's redundant to say that the distal radial metaphysis is dorsally displaced 
relative to um, the proximal radial fragment. Uh, you can just say there is dorsal displacement of the distal radial fracture. Angulation. Uh, we talked about angulation earlier. You want bones to heal uh, in an anatomic position. If you have too great displacement or angulation, you start getting limb length discrepancies, that type of thing too. So in orthopedic surgery, they like probably angulation to describe, be described in terms of valgus and varus rather than an apex description. So I wanted to cover those terms. So basically with valgus and varus, valgus is when the fracture is pointing away from the body. Um, so going away from the midline of the body, and varus is when it's going towards. So for example, we have abnormal angulation here of this femur on the left, and so would that be a valgus or a varus? Well, I'm looking at that, and basically the left femoral shaft is pointing more away in terms of where it's supposed to be, and so basically this is going to be a vera angulation. Now, this is going to be abnormal angulation bilaterally uh, at the knees um, due to arthritis. And so basically, because of that, then we have a more uh, valgus angulation here because the tibia is pointing more away from the midline than uh, I would like. And so this is going to be a valgus because it's pointing away from the body. I think I might have said pointing away uh, for the vera. Um, I meant... Um, towards the body uh, on the coxavera. It gets confusing. Just remember, if you're looking at something, um, either the, the knee or the femur or the whatever, think about what normal should be first, and then take the distal um, uh, bone or fragment or whatever, and then uh, move that towards where, where you see it. And then you say, okay, is this towards the body or away? So with these knees, they're kind of too knock need because the tibia is pointing too away from the body. So then it's going to be um, a valgus. And it kind of looks like an L, and that's why I put um, a capital L here. On here, this kind of looks like an R in the femur. So that's one way to remember what valgus and varus is. And so um, it's complex. You just have to keep on thinking about it and <laughs> it'll come second nature. Okay, so avulsion fractures uh, indicates an attachment site. We have uh, in anatomy, so by definition, basically we have these soft tissue and bony structures and you have things connecting one to the other. And aponeurosis connects a muscle to a muscle. A tendon connects a muscle to a bone. And then a ligament connects a bone to a bone. Right. So avulsion fractures occur at sites of attachments of these soft tissue structures on the bone. And for whatever reason, the way we're made in the pediatric population, the bone will fail with a tensile force before the tendon does. In the adult, the opposite is true. So when I look at plane films on children, I will pay particular attention to sites where there are tendinous origins. So, for example, in this one, we have something here. And it's not too displaced, so it'll probably heal okay, especially if the child has normal function, but just pain. But what is that? Well, basically, something arises from there, and it's been yanked off, and so the, the bone um, has fractured. And uh, basically, you have the, you know, in, on anatomy, there are all these different little sites of attachment. That would be a rectus femoris origin at the anterior um, inferior iliac spine or sartorius from the anterior superior iliac spine. And so this is a schematic of these different sites of attachments um, on the bone. And it actually is a little bit harder. And in here, we're talking about um, uh, obliquity and we're talking about getting good views and whatnot because a lot of times, if it's too oblique and there are um, structures superimposed on each other, then it's hard to, to say if two sites are really near each other or, or two things are actually far from each other, but they're superimposed on each other in an oblique view, then, then again, we're looking at 2D images um, and making a 3D image in our mind. And so we, we need the best 2D images that we can to do that. Um, intraarticular fractures I talked about earlier, uh, and then this is a good thing bringing in what we were talking about earlier in terms of the density of different body parts. 
looking for the fat fluid level. Um, we call it the chicken soup sign because fat rises, right? So here there's a less radiodense area overlying more dense blood. And so that's forming in the joint space. And that's what just happens, right? When you have an intraarticular fracture, blood starts oozing out of the bone, out of the medullary cavity, and just fills the joint space. And and blood itself can be an irritant and, and do things. So intraarticular fractures are really important because of the osteochondral fragments. We all need to know about those just because if there's a large fragment in the joint space, it acts as a loose body. And uh, you do, we see it on a daily basis, you know, things form in the elbow joint and people can't fully extend anymore, that type of thing. So it's really important in terms of um, considering fractures. When I look at fractures and start dictating, I, I uh, will say intraarticular if not. And then if it's extraarticular, then you're done. But if it's intraarticular, then how many fragments are that type of thing? It is important for the surgery. Uh, stress and fatigue fractures, we see this all the time. Um, a lot of people love to exercise outdoors. A lot of people participate in sports that have um, micro trauma happening on a minute to minute basis. And so the body basically will fracture after a time. So shin splints and March fractures are really common examples of that. And it's really interesting because we were talking about earlier in terms of how bone forms. Well, a lot of times you have a stress reaction before a fracture. And so if it's not enough to break the entire bone, then basically you have a reaction. The bone's just trying to heal itself, but it can't complete the job because the force is still there. And so in A here, you can see that there's a stress reaction. There's this smooth periosteal and cortical thickening at the anterior tibia, really common site for a stress fracture or stress reaction. And I don't obviously see a stress fracture, a lucent line, but in B, I do. And you can kind of see that. So all this is really important to talk about and catch. And sometimes it can be really, these are other examples. Sometimes it can be really subtle. And so, for example, this is a really obvious March fracture or stress reaction of the second metatarsal. Um, but sometimes they're really, really subtle and you only catch them again on one or one or two images. It's really important because if someone is training for a marathon and you don't see it, or the pictures aren't high quality, then we're doing them harm because they're still exercising what is a fracture. We talked about this earlier, insufficiency fracture. Here, because there's a fracture of the left pubic body, there is more density there. Oftentimes where there's one fracture, there's another. So insufficiency fractures can happen all around the pelvis. And so I, I see that one. Uh, when you see pathology, you get excited about one you always got to look for the other, the next one, the next one, the next one. So is there something happening here in the right sacral area? I'm not sure. I'm not a percent. And, and here you can see why it can be really difficult because we have all these fecal shadows and it can obscure things. But this is a good example of insufficiency fracture. Also a good example of the different densities again. Look how black that lucent gas is, the air within the rectum around the stool. Also these shadows, muscle shadows, you, know, you can tell these different uh, muscle groups around the femur and the fat plane separating them. Uh, fracture reduction and healing, internal versus external fixation. As described, you know, internal, you're putting in internal hardware. External, X-fix is basically a, a cage with wires that are it's outside. Uh, dynamic versus static fixation. Uh, some screws that are put in aren't meant to move, and others are lag screws and compression screws, kind of that uh, allow movement. Healing is seen as demineralization at the site of fracture and then as callus formation. So the osteoclasts go to work before the osteoblasts do. And healing is slowed by age, smoking, nutritional deficiency, steroids, all these other things. And so um, they're hard to really make a determination on often. And so it's really important to know when the actual fracture was because how quickly a bone heals is dependent upon the site. And so it's helpful sometimes when um, technologists give me kind of more information and when an ORIF was performed because then I can kind of make an assessment of healing. It helps me. Uh, healing. So yeah, I told you earlier in the lecture that union is basically healing. They're pretty much synonymous. You can have normal healing, but it be delayed. That's why the time frame of the trauma or surgery is really important. 
Non-union occurs in various forms, such as hypertrophic or atrophic. And then malunion, I was telling you, um, you can have two fracture ends heal, but if they're at a 20 degree angle, that's not really helpful because you're not gonna function normally with that much angulation. Avascular necrosis is when the bone just dies. When you have trauma, it can become devascularized, and so that's a big problem. Secondary infection is always an issue. Uh, we see it all the time. Hardware failure is something that can happen as well. And so if the bone doesn't normally heal, then all that force is on the hardware, and the hardware will, will fail at some point. Other things can happen that may be problematic. I, I'm not exactly sure I put in comp complex regional pain syndrome uh, or reflex, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, but it's other things that um, can cause pain as well and can cause problems with the healing. Um, heterotopic ossification, sometimes the body gets a little bit too exuberant in the healing process, and heterotopic ossification is the description of bone occurring where it normally doesn't, so it's in a heterotopic location. And this can happen in muscle, it can happen in fat, it can happen anywhere, and so the old term for that was myositis ossificans, but it can happen in other places besides muscle, and so HO is the new preferred term for that. Here's an example of avascular necrosis of a scaphoid fracture. The scaphoid bone is the most commonly fractured carpal bone in the body. And in this case, you can see that there's a proximal pole fracture because of the circumflex nature of the arteries feeding the bone, curving backward. This is a bad site for the fracture versus a waist or a, a distal pole fracture. And this bone is dying, and so it's becoming sclerotic. Um, that's what happens in avascular necrosis. We still have normal alignment, though. Everything is where it's supposed to be. You can see these joint spaces are about two to three millimeters each in the intercarpal spaces and that's normal. Okay, so the soft tissues, we have joints, tendons, muscles, ligaments, neurovascular bundle. Talked about all these uh, somewhat before. Now I'll focus on them a little bit more. Joint alignment, we talked about valgus and varus. Valgus, once again, is pointing away from the body abnormally and varus is pointing towards the body abnormally. And the the easy mnemonic to remember is the hip and the knee again. So valgus, the knock knee appearance, the, the feet are too away from the body, and then varus is towards the body. So that femur where it was at a 90 degree angle looked like an R, and it's it, the femoral shaft, the distal femur, is too positioned um, towards the center of the body more than usual, right? Terms that I haven't said yet, subluxation and dislocation. At a joint, normally the bone is opposing the opposite bone where it's supposed to be. Um, but when you have a force disrupting that, you can have subluxation um, or dislocation. And subluxation is where it's off the bone but not quite completely dislocated versus dislocation is where it's completely off. So when you're talking about, for example, an anterior shoulder dislocation, again, a really common injury. Dislocation is when it's frankly just off. Uh, subluxation is when it's barely off the ball and tee joint, right? And uh, sometimes it's harder to see. Diastasis is basically when you have an abnormal uh, widening at a joint. We talked about intraarticular loose bodies earlier. In the context of a fracture, when I was t saying that it's very important to try to identify all osteochondral fragments, a lot of times, though, you can have intraarticular loose bodies that are not osteochondral fragments from trauma, but just developing because of arthritis or other pathologies, such as uh, tumor type pathologies within the joint. So that's that's important. The history given is often can't extend or can't flex, and then there's this big obvious reason why. And then impingement pathology is basically when something is preventing something from moving normally. An impingement could be secondary to a bony structure or a soft tissue structure, or you know hardware even. If hardware a screw is sticking into a joint when it's not supposed to be that type of thing. Okay, tendons. We have muscles, and the muscles in the body are all different types of shapes. And um, all of them have a different type of relationship, a certain structure. Uh, as the muscles turn into tendons, it's the musculotendinous or myotendinous junction. And a lot, that's a really important place because that's a lot of times where we'll see failure. So, for example, Achilles 
tendon rupture, really common injury, see it all the time. It'll usually happen at the myotendinous junction, about four to six or five to seven centimeters, something like that, above the calcaneal insertion. Uh, the tendon, as we said before, that's what joins a muscle to the bone. Tenosynovitis, so uh, the tendon has a tendon sheath, and if that tendon sheath gets inflamed, then fluid develops and it can be painful. See it all the time, really common. If structures don't have a tendon sheath, you can still have fluid around them, so that's called a peritinonitis. So the Achilles does not have a tendon sheath, but it can get inflamed, and so you can get a peritinopathy. Subluxation, tendons can get off their rocker just as much as joints can. So, for example, at the wrist, you can have the extensor carpi ulnaris pop off. At the ankle, you can have the perineus longus brevis pop off. At the shoulder, you can have the biceps long head. It's usually in a groove in the proximal humerus, but if it pops out, then your reflection is going to be impaired. You can have calcific tendonitis. That's when you get calcium crystals forming in the tendons, and that can cause pain as well as range of motion issues. And then stenosing tenosynovitis, it's just a fancy term of scar tissue forming where it's not supposed to at these tendon and tendon sheath attachments. And people will get that in their, their fingers after injury, and it can be really bad. You can start having a, a trigger finger. Really important in terms of soft tissue structures, and a lot of times we don't see that on plain radiography or CT even, MRI might be required, but we don't need to. I don't need an MRI to tell me that the scapholunate ligament is torn here because we have this tremendous widening of the scapholunate interval. So I would just say that if I was dictating this out. I don't know when it happened. I don't see secondary arthritis, but yeah, there's a scapholunate ligament tear and the alignment is messed up. There's a widened scaphalunate interval, but the capitate isn't proximally migrated yet. So it can always be worse, right? So that's a good radiograph showing a lot of different things. Here we have calcific tendinopathy or tendinitis of the distal supraspinatus. And I can say that it's distal supraspinatus because that's where I expect that to be on this external rotation image of the shoulder. You can actually see so much here. Like we're, I was talking about the biceps long head tendon. Here's the lesser and the greater tuberosity. So that's the intertubercular groove between those two structures where the biceps long head tendon would live, right? Normal alignment of the bones. Muscle injury. If we're talking about muscle injuries that are not a frank tear, then we're talking about a strain. And muscles and tendons, because they belong to the same unit, they strain. Ligaments sprain. So it's it's that's the correct terminology. And you can have local fluid formation, hematoma, abscess, myonecrosis. If you are really aggressively exercising, people will strain their muscles. And in terms of soft tissue injuries, every compartment has a certain amount of pressure it can tolerate. And so we see this from time to time too, where people have a really severe strain and the the fascial compartment pressure will increase and the muscle will actually just frankly die and a fluid will form. We, we might not see this on a plain film, but you can often see fluid collections in plain film. So sometimes I'll see a femoral fluid collection and just say it's there and CT or MRI for, for further evaluation if, if clinically indicated, that type of thing. Edema is uh, often seen in overuse injuries, but uh, maybe actually just be kind of a normal finding if after a marathon, for example, people will get um, edema on their muscles. And so now with MRI, we can see a lot more, but basically there are all these fancy terms coming out to describe uh, kind of normal or uh, slightly pathological conditions of the human body. Uh, you can get uh, edema and denervation injury. Uh, if a nerve is cut, then the muscle will initially get edematous before it atrophies away. Uh, radiation will cause insult, and you'll get edema there. Autoimmune causes will uh, lead to edema. Edema is just a, a fancy word for saying fluid, and fluid is the, the body's natural response to any type of injury. And then calcifications in the long term, um, calcifications often will indicate where a muscle has been injured before. And so, for example, that calcific tendinopathy, who knows, you know, maybe the remote underlying cause of that was um, small micro tears in the 
the distal supraspinatus tendon, uh, that type of thing. Sometimes calcifications can just happen, though, um, and and that's what we were talking about earlier in terms of heterotopic ossification. Again, also as a response to injury. Uh, articular cartilage, all the only thing protecting your bone from hitting the other bone is cartilage. It's basically the shock absorber. And so we see it really well in MRI. Um, we don't see it well in plain films. But the, the whole reason there's a joint space is because there is interposed material. Otherwise, the bone would be right on the bone, right? So if there is bone on bone, then you have full thickness cartilage loss, such as here. There's really very little radioscaphoid or uh, radiocarpal or onocarpal joint space to speak of. Um, so we can kind of infer that there is complete cartilage loss. And then other things start to happen and starts falling apart, right? So we have this large subchondral cyst here. Uh, the nerves, not much to say here. Uh, there are nerves all throughout the body. So uh, if you know your anatomy, then if, uh, for example, if I see that there's a fracture located between the proximal, the junction between the proximal third and the middle third of the radius, I might say something about um, potential radial nerve injury because I want the orthopedic surgeon and clinical team to kind of be aware of that uh, beforehand. Was there a radial nerve palsy before the surgery? That type of thing. So yeah, nerves everywhere. It's just more anatomy and then potential for um, uh, pathophysiology, depending on, on what's fractured or where, where a tumor is. Um, really important every time I dictate out tumor cases, where is the neurovascular bundle. There's a lot of variance as well. Um, nerves can often split um, early or split late or that type of thing. So and then kids, just going back to kids, they're just different. Um, bringing up a lot of concepts there again and again and again in this lecture. So we were talking about ossification centers earlier. Most of the uh, skeleton is enchondral ossification, so developing from a cartilaginous matrix first. And so with kids, it's really important uh, to get uh, good films because if there is injury, not only do we care about the articular extension, but if there's an injury to the physis, the growth plate, uh, physis is, again, exactly synonymous with growth plate, right? So if there's an injury to the physis or growth plate, what can happen is um, early closure. And if you have early closure, then you have limb length def deficiencies, that type of thing. So we have a, through this in, this is a really, this comes up all the time. It's a Salter-Harris classification, a fracture. There's a lot of classification schemes out there, but I thought this was a nice thing to throw in because it just brings up all these concepts that we've been talking about in uh, musculoskeletal imaging. Type 1 is through the growth plate, and 2, 3, 4, and 5 are other variations thereof. Finally, I went to a lecture many years ago, and it stuck with me because the person said, do the right thing. And as a technologist, you will be on the front line and will be the first set of eyes on the image. And you're so important because there are things that happen. Uh, everyone's human. And uh, I remember a case where someone called and said, oh, there was a fracture there, but you didn't dictate it out. And things like that, it, they just tremendously make a big difference. And um, uh, I guess doing the right thing is basically, it, it helps us all from a medical legal standpoint. But at the end of the day, it's doing the right thing for the patient, which is why we're all here to begin with. So, yeah, do the right thing. Um, the end. Thank you for your attention.